course, we've been going through the book of Revelation, uh, which is always exciting. And um, today we're going to be talking about what is the tribulation and how it relates to the rapture. And uh, this is really a big issue in Christianity. Things, uh, something that we debate all the time. Can you pass them out, Patty? Thank you. This uh, little chart that Patty is passing out is just a real basic overview of the four different views. One of them almost nobody believes anymore. Um, but the four basic views on when the rapture is going to happen in relation to the tribulation. And uh, what is the tribulation? Ben? What is the tribulation? Seven years. So uh, what we basically believe in, in our church and in our organization is that um, the rapture is going to happen, and we're going to talk more about this. Then there's going to be this seven-year period that most of the book of Revelation is about uh, when all the bad stuff is going to happen, or a lot of it. And um, it's a seven-year period. The first three and a half years are... Drastic, but they're less drastic. The second three and a half years are crazy, over the top, worst time in the history of the world kind of thinking. Okay? Really bad stuff happening. It has to do with the Antichrist, and we're going to get to all those things in the coming weeks. Uh, but it's very serious. And God doesn't tell us this stuff to scare us, He tells us to prepare us. He tells us what's coming in the end. Now, the basic issue that we're talking about today is. We believe that before that seven year period, we the church, right? The Lord's gonna come and we'll read the scripture in just a minute. He's gonna return. He's the people in the graves who are in Christ are gonna rise up to meet him in the air. We're gonna rise up also to meet those people in the air. And we're gonna be with the Lord for the rest of our time in existence, which is forever. It's really a beautiful story. But that's basically what we're talking about today. I have a few introductory things that I want to talk about first. In this tribulation period, um, God's spirit will be removed from the earth. This is a huge, huge deal. And um, right now, you know, of course, we think about the war going on with Russia over there. We think about all of those kind of things. And um, it's a bad time, right? We, we face issues in our life. But when that spirit is gone, it's really going to be crazy, right? It's just going to set this thing in motion. There's a lady named Jan Markell. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she makes this statement. She says, things aren't falling out of control. They're falling into place, just like the Bible says that they would happen like that. And, um, of course, evil will increase in that time. Again, it's not to scare us. It's to tell us what's coming. It's nice to know the future, right? What's my schedule like next week? Well, here's exactly what's going to happen. It never happens that way, but it's nice to have an idea about what might happen. Almost all people believe in Christianity that there's going to be the seven-year period at the end, and then the Lord will return. The question is, number one, is there a rapture? And number two, when will it happen? And that's really what we're talking about today. Uh, does somebody have Revelation 3.20? Boom. He's like, <laughs> that's an easy one, right? All the way in the back. I read the book. You want me to have it ready? <laughs> Patty and uh, Logan have been coming and helping us with the yards over here. Yeah, we really appreciate that. Amen. Big deal. Paul said he wouldn't do it, so who's <laughs> playing ball? I got to knock her out. Oh, Go ahead. Patty. It says, "Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me." Amen. That's kind of our mission, right? Where God is knocking on doors. Not only is He knocking on our door, but people that we know in our life, and our job is to lead the people to that door. To take them to Jesus Christ. So when we're studying the book of Revelation, that's still our focus. That's still the main, main idea that we're teaching. But we also want to know what's coming. Now, in the uh, when Jesus came the first time, right, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Old Testament is almost all about Jesus. 
But many of the people, when they saw Jesus, they didn't think he was the Messiah that was supposed to come. They were mistaken, right? And they were so sad, uh, many of the Jews and their religious ways, they weren't able to recognize what God was saying. So when we talk about our view on this, state, on this issue tonight, we also have to be ready to say, well, if they weren't exactly expecting the right thing, maybe we won't be expecting the right thing. We have to look for what God hap what happens uh, in the future of our world and let it dictate. But we do have our beliefs. I like this. I want to share this with you very, qu very quickly, and then we'll get into the scripture. Um, there's people right now who are preparing for the rapture in this way. They're writing books. And they're making, you know, the little thumb things with a computer. They have all the information on them. Exactly. And they're leaving messages to the people they love. And they say, hey, I want to leave this with you. I know you don't think it's right. I know you don't think this rapture is going to happen. But just in case, I want to leave this with you. And boom, it'll be a list of here's what uh, the Bible says about when this rapture happens. Here's what's coming. Here's how you come to the Lord. And it's a beautiful thing, right? They're letting their belief that Jesus is coming back, that the rapture is going to happen, cause action in their life to say, let's say that I have a, a brother who's unsaved or whoever, a friend or whoever it is. I want them to be ready just in case they meet the rap miss the rapture. I love that idea. Amen. Of course, our question is, how does it all fit together? And that's what we're trying to do in this study. Amen. In all tribulation, right? This is the tribulation, right? We can say every Christian is going to face tribulation. Sometimes we face that right now. Many times in Christianity right now, that's exactly what's happening. What we're talking about is the tribulation. It's the appointed end of things. This, again, the seven-year period when everything just goes crazy. But in every uh, one of these tribulation periods, God wants us to be prepared. That's why we're doing this tonight. So we're prepared. Not just for that tribulation. We want to learn about that. But if we're uh, facing tribulation in our life right now, he wants us to be prepared for that too. The Bible over and over again talks about these things that we're going to face. He wants us to be strong. That's not always easy, is it? Uh, not everybody is... He-Man or Hulk Hogan or whoever you want to put, or Patty, it would be Wonder Woman. Not everybody has that type of inside of them. But God wants us to have a spiritual side of us yes. that is that. So if something happens tonight on the way home or tomorrow or next week, he wants us to be able to say, even though this is happening in my life right now, I'm going to be strong. So if something, if something happened that one of us missed the rapture, it's not all over. He still wants us to be prepared. He still wants us to be strong. He wants us to be confident in him. And he wants us to endure. Yes. I'm going to get up tomorrow. I'm going to get up when I get knocked down next time. And that's also going to be what's going on in the tribulation. Whoever is left still has an opportunity because of God's incredible mercy. Uh, the devil's two main ways that he gets us is through persecution. Have you ever talked to somebody about the Lord? And they, you can just see it in their eyes. They want to punch you right in the face. <laughs> That's persecution. Leave me alone, you crazy Christians. We get that. We understand that. That's happened to every Christian who ever tries to spread the gospel. That's what happens. And the second way that the devil gets to us is through false teachings. So as I was preparing for this, uh, this message, my goal is always to say, what is God saying? What is, the, in this case with Revel Revelation, what is John trying to say? What is Jesus trying to say to us? That has to be the goal. Even though we might not interpret, interpret perfectly always, that has to be the goal. I can't come in and say, okay, here's what I believe in my heart. How do I make the Bible prove what I believe? We cannot do it that way. What is John writing and what's he trying to teach us? The devil uses false teachings uh, almost more than anything. So here we go. The pre-tribulation view of the rapture. 
Again, there's three main events that this whole thing is built around in Revelation. Uh, we have the rapture, which we believe will happen first, uh, the tribulation, and then this thousand year period of the millennium. So rapture, seven years of terrible things going on, and then the millennium, this thousand year reign where Jesus comes back and conquers all evil. That's the basic outline. Now, our belief, this pre-tribulation rap, uh, rapture, on a huge level, I think it's always been on, on some level a part of a church, but on a big level, it explodes in the 1800s. We don't believe it because of that, but we don't believe it because people have always thought this way. When the Protestant movement happened against the Catholic Church, when we said we don't want to be a part of you anymore, the main idea was, we don't care about tradition, we don't care about popes, we care about this. It was called sola scriptura, right? What does the Bible teach? That's the reason that we would say that we believe in this pre-tribulation rapture. So let's read these texts. This is the most important thing we're going to do tonight, is read these texts. God's word into our hearts is supposed to be why we believe what we believe. Okay? It'll take just five minutes here, and I think it's very important. Who has 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18? Anybody? I mean, I have it in this book somewhere. <laughs> 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 I passed them all. Yeah, I passed them all out, I think. 1 Thessalonians what? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. <laughs> 13 to 18. This is really the main text on this subject. You want me to read it? Sure. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, and we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means uh, precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. The last part that Pastor read there uh, is a really important part of this text, right? Uh, Paul, uh, these people are thinking, let's say, you know, God, somebody in my life passed away, my grandma, whoever it was, last week and they're just learning about these doctrines this is all brand new to these people right it's like well grandma died last week she was a believer what's going to happen i'm worried that she's not going to be there when the lord comes up and takes us home and and paul writes here he says comfort one i don't want you guys to worry i don't want you to worry about these things and then he starts to explain this whole chapter talks about this and uh he says well we all know the lord's going to come back the dead in Christ will rise first. If you say that to somebody on the street who's not a believer, they will think you're crazy. And then we are, who are alive when he returns will be caught up in the air to meet him and them. And after that point, we who go in the rapture will never be separated from the Lord from that point forward. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. He's going to come and get us, and that's what's going to happen. That's the reason we believe what we believe. Now, there, there's a couple other scriptures that we're going to read, but this chapter 4 of Thessalonians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, uh, especially 1st Thessalonians, is one of the first books written in the church, uh, in the Bible. And Paul is putting this on the priority list, right? This is what they're thinking about at, the, at that time. So the main expectation of the church is Jesus coming back and when he's coming back. And Paul takes up that subject here. Let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. Who has that one? I have it. 
had it, I'd probably get some extra shots. Say, say that again. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. You said 8 9? A third 12. I'm sorry. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That was 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 4. Yes, sir. I must have a different translation here. How about uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10? Okay. <clears throat> and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, delivered us from the wrath to come. Amen. And is 5.9 also on that same one? No. Just one? Yeah. Right there. Yep. First Thessalonians five nine. <laughs> She's like, I heard you. Well, I have the I have the one ten on my paper too, so I was prepared to read that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Thessalonians five nine. <laughs> For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. Amen. That's pretty basic, huh? And uh, uh, in any view that we have of what we're talking about today, that's also true. It is in the end, Christians are going to live with Christ forever. Again, uh, the basic thing everybody agrees on, that seven-year period at the end, and Christ returns after that in some form. And we're going to talk a little more about that later. And I'll come back and we'll read 310 in just a minute, okay? Or 110, I'm sorry. We're just going to read two more scriptures and then we'll talk about it a little bit. The Lord himself, uh, we believe this pre-tribulation view and the question is why? Why would we believe that? As we were getting ready for this, as I was getting ready for this, that's the big question. We believe anything that we believe. If you go next door to the Baptist church over there or down the road to the Catholic church over here, they're going to have a little different perspective on this issue. Why do we believe this? Well, first, the Lord himself promised to deliver us. And um, who has Revelation 3.10? Go ahead, Daniel. Because you have kept my command to preserve, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world test those who dwell on earth. Amen. And uh, that's to one of the churches there in, in Revelation. Literally, that statement means, I will keep you out of the wrath to come. And I believe that's straight to us as Christians. When the Lord comes, he's going to come before the uh, dark and terrible day in the end. That's one of the reasons that scripture, that we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Only this view that we have allows the Bible statement true that says this, nobody knows the day or the hour when he's going to come. Nobody knows that. So I think we talked about this a few weeks ago. Pastor mentioned it. So if I, if I believe that the Lord's going to come in the middle of that seven-year period, well, if I know when the beginning of the seven-year period begins, I'm also going to know when he's going to return in the, in the middle of it, right? Uh, I will know when he's going to come back. And if I know when the seven-year period begins, and I believe he's going to come back after um, the tribulation, I'll know when he's going to come back at that point, too. And uh, so our view, the view that we have, I believe is the best one. The church is to be delivered from the wrath to come. And go ahead and read verse 10 there. And this is the last verse. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. Amen. 
And the final, the final reason is, the, I think, the biggest reason. If we look at the book of Revelation, the first three chapters are the letters to the churches, right? From chapter 4 through chapter 18, there's not one word about the church. Not one word about the church. So as these terrible things start to happen in chapter 4, no church. Chapter 5, chapter 6, all the way through 18, all the way up until when Jesus comes uh, for the final time, there's no mention of the church there. And this is a big reason, I think the biggest reason we believe what we believe in. Pastor mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, the middle tribulation people, they believe the rapture will happen after three and a half years, right? Right in the middle. It makes some sense. I don't fully agree with it, and I think Pastor said the same thing, but it makes some sense, right? You, you have when that terrible last three and a half years starts, they believe that that's when the rapture will happen. And um, it's a not a very popular view at this point, but it's also a view that we would consider, that we look at and say, um, maybe, maybe, right? We start to see an antichrist identified. And I believe uh, the thing that starts the seven year period is when the antichrist, this is my personal opinion, uh, signs an agreement with Israel that says, um, we have a seven year agreement that's gonna bring peace to the Middle East, right? Big deal, imagine if that was here today and it worked, it would change the world. Well, that's, I believe that's what's gonna happen. That's the start of the tribulation. So this mid-tribulation point, the idea is it's kind of a leaning between, is he gonna come at the beginning or is he gonna come at the end? And you kind of say, well, how about if we say he's gonna come back in the middle, right? It kind of answers both questions and takes the edge off a little bit. And, and you're right, there's obviously a, a very uh, pointed split in the tribulation, the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years. Yeah. And, and it, which you've already stated a couple of times. Yeah. But with it being the wrath or the punishment, they call it the last three and a half years is the wrath of God, the punishment. That's what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah after he had removed, uh, after he had removed his people from Sodom and Gomorrah. It's that kind of wrath, it's punishment. We don't see God doing that, uh, allowing for the punishment of his people. Right. Um, and uh, I think that to me, that's a huge, you know, pot, maybe possibility of midterm. I mean, mid, but I agree with you 100%. Whereas the first three and a half year is just natural disasters, the world falling apart, problems with the world, heavier yep. than what were before. Um, but it's not this. And, uh, but, uh, but I agree with you. Now you said you felt like the most powerful argument is about the church, which is true. Does it is, and I agree that's a very high one. For me, it's all about the first thing you mentioned, and that is about the uh, the fact that uh, we aren't supposed to know the day or the hour. Yeah. And and honestly, if if it was anything other than pre-trib, we would know exactly. Especially right. if it was post-trib, we'd know exactly when seven years is. <laughs> And you could wait till that day and you could do it, you know, and then you could do it. There's no no ambiguity to it at all. And that's a big part of the scripture is the ambiguity of the rapture. Yeah. And so like each, each of these views that we're going to talk about, let me just have a couple more, but uh, they all use, we all use the same scriptures. It's just a matter of interpret, interpretation of the scripture. That's why I said, I said what I said earlier. When we pick up the Bible, it's important for us to say, leave our stuff at the door and say, what is this trying to say, right? That's the goal in everything that we do. I heard a joke, uh, of course, uh, I didn't write the joke, but uh, the guy said, uh, I wanna take all responsibility. It was really Pastor Bob, no, he said, uh, he said, seven years of tribulation, I've been married for 50 years. I can survive anything. Um, of course, God would say, there's something different coming down the road. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Paul's not laughing. Paul's just sitting there. Back. It's been great for me. And yeah. He enjoys tribulation. <laughs> you thrive in that condition. I like that. Okay, now we're going to talk about alien life and flat earth. Right? Okay. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. 
can I just one make one comment? I mean, is it alien related? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. Maybe, maybe. But when we read the Bible, right now, imagine, right? That's just one marriage. You're, you know, fifty years. But what about King Solomon has seven hundred wives? <laughs> Multiply that seven hundred yeah. times. Well, in my case, I've got to be careful here because I have a habit of sticking my foot in my mouth uh, in a big way. But I think Solomon's wise, first of all, that's very wrong. I don't think God wanted him to have more than one wife. But uh, I think they were more obedient than my wife. Oh! So, not that I, not that I want my wife to be obedient. I'm just saying that I think that's how he survived. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love you. Yeah. Well, Ready up. Yeah. Big trouble. Big trouble. Yeah. Next week we're going to be speaking on uh, Donnie's divorce. <laughs> Amen. And then we have the last view here. Thank God. No. Is the post-tribulation view, right? Now, there's three that are very closely related. And we're going to spend just a minute talking about this. Um, the post-tribulation view is after those seven years, right, where we believe that Christ is coming back to kill the devil and defeat him and put him Ooh. in the Man. bottomless pit and everything, right? Well, they believe kind of the same thing, but that that's when it's all over. You know, why would you have a rapture at that point when, yeah. you know, that would be the question there. But again, they would have an answer to that. So the debate is never ending. I like this old Jewish proverb that says this. It, People over there debate like crazy. It never ends, which drives me crazy. And uh, But they, when they have a question and they want a short answer, they say, answer me while standing on one foot. In other words, I don't want to talk about this for days. Let's have a short answer. And that's what happens on these issues in the church. Are they important? Of course they're important. They're God's word. We want to dig in. We want to get it right and uh, study till the end of time here. Um, but we also don't want to let these things drive us crazy, which is exactly what can happen. Yes. If we had different views on these things, that's okay. And I don't know if I put it in here or not, but one of my favorite sayings is a, a quote from a thousand years ago. And it says this, it says, um, if I can remember it, uh, in essentials unity, in other words, those basic yep. things that tie us together as Christians, we got to stand together on those things and not let darkness in. So in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. So things just like this that don't demand our salvation on those issues. We have liberty. We have the ability to have our interpretation. We always want to be right, of course, but we have liberty. And then the last part of it is in all things charity. No matter what we're talking about or who we're talking to, we do it in love in everything that we do especially when we're talking to a believer who disagrees with us we got to love each other we're on the same team right amen and, and also along that lines i think it's just important to kind of know what you believe and what your church believes which we believe pre-trib yeah but it's not important i don't share when i share with non-believers i don't share that there is controversy about it either in all yeah. three of them the point is that, you know, you don't go in, you know, if you want to talk about the rapture, you believe it's going to happen before the tribulation. If that's what you believe, you should share that. We're only sharing this because we want you to understand a perspective somebody else is coming from and not to be surprised by, nor would I argue with them. I don't argue with anybody about this. It's a non-essential. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and uh, it is not worth separation or division. But it is important to know where people are coming from. Absolutely. But when you're talking non-believers, don't mix, don't, don't, don't confuse it. No, it's about Christ. Yeah, and uh, that's so important in everything that we do. I, have five I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm blind. You have to yell. No, that's at me. okay. I have five cents to share. I don't believe. In, <laughs> just five cents. I don't believe in post-trib rapture because it reminded me of we we read the Bible together and we finished the Old Testament and. I don't know where exactly, but God had to punish his people because it's, he's flawless, he's shiny. He, he cannot let sin into his glory. Right. And he was punishing his people. And But while they were getting punished and praying to him, he grieved like it, like 
Imagine his heart being ripped out for his people. Yeah. Now when the, the Christians who love him and pray to him and are as much as obedient as they can be because we're all flawed, right? And he knows that, thank you, Jesus. I cannot imagine that somebody like he knows and his people who love him now too, that he would send them to being hurt based on the previous like Old Testament where he yeah. saw his people even when they get punished and he did that like how much he grieved I just don't believe that that's why I don't believe in post well, at all in a way I agree with you in another way like people in the first three centuries of the church I mean they were almost facing this type of persecution right. I mean they were slaughtered over nothing and you know we know the stories, right? Uh, burned at the stake, burned upside down. Uh, and this has happened even so, recently in our world today. There's people being executed that we never hear about. It's not one or two people. It's many people only because they're Christians. So do we face persecution? It's different here in the U.S., but around the world right now, as we're having this class, they are being persecuted on a massive level. Yeah, that's yeah, they actually say that there are more people being martyred for the cause of Christ now than, than ever. Yeah. Wow. yeah, well, there's more people, which is crazy, like in the U.S., right? Um, but around the world, this is going on. And But it also happened when revival was happening. Pastors yeah. talked about this before. In our country, there's less of a revival going on. I believe that we can take it the other direction and, and have big revival. Amen. But around the world, there is a massive revival going on in countries to where they want to stop out stop out Christianity and like that thank you for that pastor people die every day on a massive level only because they're Christians only because they're Christians that's persecution is it the tribulation no but it's definitely a tribulation and um, I, I agree on a certain level with what uh, Suzanne said I believe part of the reason God isn't going to, the Bible says several times, he's not going to have a school for you fat. That's by interpretation, right? And it's a really big issue. It's a huge issue. But regardless of what we're going through, let's say that we were living in, you know, whatever, China, or where most of these things are happening, uh, would we still believe? Because it'd be easier just to believe in our heart and say we don't believe. These people are being caught. They admit that they believe. They know what's going to happen to them. I mean, it's a huge deal. That's strong faith. And these are the types of things that will be happening in the tribulation. Again, we believe, and I believe wholeheartedly, that we will leave in the rapture before this starts to happen. But why is there a big fight in our country going on over this stuff right now? You know, you have a big part of the population of the country who don't want Christianity to exist. It's crazy. Go ahead, Susan. When the tribulation happens, his Holy Spirit will be gone. Well, he's not going to remove his Spirit from us because the record is point. unsealed to him. Amen. Either he'll take us, but he's not going to leave us without his Spirit because yeah. we're not in Christ. Yep. So there's that. And great point. And uh, again, if we if we were in here a minute ago, <coughs> or, uh, we could have this conversation for eternity. Yes. That's, that's the issue, right? Again, our goal, let's get the truth. Let's decide on our interpretation, which for a church, we've already done that. And we know why we believe what we believe, right? We don't want to argue for eternity. There's souls out there that need to be saved. And that's job one for us. We just want to learn what God has for us. I want to mention something quickly. What time is it? You have 10 minutes. 1944. 1944? <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. So you're <laughs> the military time. I want to mention two things quickly, okay? Uh, because they're really big issues. The church that I grew up in, Fillmore, is uh, outside of the Catholic Church, the most historical view on this issue. And it was the Church of God out of Anderson, Indiana, mainstream Christianity. But they were what, what is called all millennialist. And uh, they don't believe in the millennium that we're looking forward to. They believe that when Jesus ascended after he rose from the dead, that he went up to heaven, and from that point he started reigning. And uh, it wasn't a literal thousand years, but he's reigning right now in the church age, 
they believe that's the thousand year period. And they believe as Christians, let's say somebody died 10 years after the Lord ascended to heaven, that person was part of that community. That's what they believe. And Catholicism, I want to touch on that too, kind of believes the same thing. And uh, so it's not a view that's listed on your paper there. But all millennium isn't, even though it's kind of a weird, weird, weird war. <laughs> weird word. Um, it's really a huge uh, belief in our world right now. And it's not a thing that we're going to uh, fight to the death over, but it's a huge view. And when it talks about, they talk about the rapture, it just means that at the end, when the Lord returns, that the dead, uh, not only in Christ, but all the dead, will be raised from the dead. And that's how they see that rapture happening. But that's just another view. So in closing, finally, I think what God is always forcing us to do, and he will do it also in the tribulation, forcing is a little strong, but I think it's accurate. He forces us to choose, doesn't he? We can say for all of our life, if I live to be 150 years old, eh, I don't know. Eh, I don't know, because that's kind of the general consensus of society. Eh, maybe, maybe not. The Lord comes to us and says, Donnie, today I want you to choose whether you believe or not. He wants us to choose. And what's the tribulation doing? He forces people to choose. Why? Not because he wants to judge them but because he wants to bring them home. Our nature is to be passive, to put it off till tomorrow, to not think about it. And the Lord says, Donnie, do you believe or not? He wants me to commit to him or to commit to walk away from him. And one of the, the thing I'm gonna close with tonight is uh, we know that there's bad stuff that can seep into the church. And in this issue, you know, we could believe things that were not things that we wanna believe, but um, the non-biblical worldview going on right now is seeping into the church. So when we get together like this, it's easy to say, boy, it'd be so easy to stay home tonight. It's a Thursday. Every, most people are working, right? Uh, Pastor and Jolene were in the Hawaiian Islands or something. What was it? No, I'm joking. And... Um, Right? It'd be easy just to say, why go? Well, the reason that we go is we don't want that worldview to seep into our church, into our lives. And I want to share these four thoughts with you about the worldview that we're trying to keep out. And the number one is feelings are the ultimate guide. Feelings are the ultimate guide. So when you came here tonight, half of us, at least probably, not me, but sometimes it's me, we're saying, eh, I don't know if I want to go tonight. Why? Because our feelings get in there. Rather than letting God's word or the spirit drive us to do something, the world says, well, how do you feel? You know, the old thing, if it feels good, do it. The second thing is, happiness is the ultimate goal. Wow. I think of all the things I could do that would make me happy in this one second, in the next hour, in the next four hours, might not make me so happy tomorrow or the day after that or the day after that. But that's what the world says. The only goal is happiness. And you chase that. You know what the problem is? You never get there. You never get there. That satisfaction the world desire, desires never, ever happens. We want to keep those things out of the church. Not that we don't want happiness. We just know that that idea never happens in that lane. Almost done. Two more things. The third thing is judging the ultimate is the ultimate sin. <clears throat> what do people tell Christians and why do they hate Christians, many people? How dare you come and tear, tear, tell me how to live my life? And first of all, we're not doing that, right? We're coming in and saying, here's Jesus. Let him come into your life. And then we come to church and we learn about how God wants us to live. But that's the ultimate sin in the world. Why? Because it excuses all behavior. There's no right and there's no wrong. Yeah. And that's creeping into the church. Mm -hmm. God says, whether we like it or not, there is a right and there is a wrong. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And we look to him for guidance. The last thing and we'll get out of here. God is the ultimate guess. 
God is the ultimate guest. What does that mean? Maybe, maybe not. God exists or he doesn't exist. That's creeping into the church. And, you know, it might be, it might not be. It's kind of called like an agnostic. It's maybe, maybe. God comes into our life through Christ and says, there's no maybe here. There's no maybe here. We believe Jesus is the Son of God who died for our sins, right? And when we're talking about an issue like this, something really important like the end of the world, about our Savior coming back, we want to take it in. We want to learn as much as we can, just like every page of the Bible. And then we want to go out and keep God's stuff in our life, a godly worldview. Amen. We love the book of Revelation. Pastor, you want me to close in prayer? I've got something I want to talk Awesome. Okay. Uh, Pastor Gene, did you, uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something about closing up on this. Did, did you have something you wanted to say, though? I know you didn't see your hand go up here, remember? Oh, you don't remember? Okay. You didn't, he raised his hand and you didn't see him, so I just was One time he pointed me to shoot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I need the help. I uh, want to close the part in uh, uh, with the rapture. We're going to be done with that. We're going to move on. Uh, and we're going to move into uh, actually a little more about what will really happen during the tribulation. Uh, we will deal more from a scriptural perspective. Uh, obviously, we've covered it a little bit uh, in our discussions of the rapture. And you understand a little bit of it. But there's some uh, more important things about the tribulation. Um, you know, things like can people get saved during the tribulation? Uh, will who who uh, who who might stay back? Who will uh, rise up? Uh, everyone talks about the two witnesses, different things like that. You know, these kind of things. I want to give you answers uh, about you know uh, what those are. What I see as answers for those things. So we'll be moving into that. Now, uh, I want to I want to kind of put a, a bow around this to make sure you understand because we've talked about things for now for three weeks. Uh, I think three, maybe four, but I think it was three. Number one thing is that you know that it's going to happen. The rapture is going to happen. Period. We believe that the rapture is going to happen. OK, so that's very important. I hope you got that out of the study. Uh, number number two, uh, it's also very important for us. That, that we understand the rapture is not the second coming. People get that confused all the time, which I shared with you before. The second coming of Christ is after the rapture. Very clear in the scripture. That's why we don't believe in post-trib because we don't believe they would get raptured, go right to heaven and like a ping pong ball, bounce off the heaven ceiling and come right back down for the like second the coming, ball. okay? <laughs> it's just not gonna happen, okay? Uh, so, but, so this, and, and a lot of times people get that confused. They think the rapture is the second coming. That is not. The first coming was when Jesus came to this earth as baby. The second coming is before the, before the millennial reign, and it is after the tribulation. Okay? The rapture is a different point of time. Number three, it's important you know we believe in pre trib. It's important. I want it to be very clear. We believe in pre trib. But number four says be ready for anything. If we end up having to go through the tribulation, be ready. And because I mean that's why a lot of people tell me they teach in in the, uh, they teach uh, uh, you know mid or post because they just want everybody ready to have to go through it and they'll be strong enough and we'll prepare them and then if they get to go early, yay! Is uh, something they didn't expect, right? So I can see that in a way. I mean that's probably the best argument for it. But the point is we need to be ready for anything. That's all I'm trying to tell you. I don't know. It is not clear on purpose in the scripture. Things that are clear in the scripture on purpose are things that are clear in the scripture are clear on purpose because they're important. They're essentials. It is very clear. There is one way to heaven. It is through Jesus Christ, right? You must believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that you died upon. Believe you raised from the dead. You must confess that He is your Lord. Amen. With your mouth, right? We know this is clear. It gets down to the very details. It is not detailed about when the trip, when the uh, rapture will happen because God didn't want it to be clear. Yes? I think that's a question for next time, but um, you know the virgins with the oil in their lamp? They all had mm -hmm. oil, but some were ready in the Lord from the right. and some had oil too, but they were doing other things, mm -hmm. and the ones with the oil that were waiting ready were taken, and the ones who had oil, which means they probably had 
Christ and the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. but they didn't have enough, you know, maybe more carnal. Is it, uh, my question is, would the ones, obviously, the ones with the less oil in the lamp, they didn't have enough? Right. They were left, so in the tribulation, and that might be a question for next mm -hmm. time, will there be people left with the Holy, or like, who believed, and then can still minister? Absolutely. Absolutely. I believe it's very likely that there are people sitting in this room today that will go through the tribulation because they weren't right with God. They did not occupy until they came. And I believe they'll be left behind. And I believe they'll be left behind. They'll be witnesses. And I believe they will be evangelists. They will know that they know what happened, yeah. even if they try to tell them that the aliens did it. <laughs> right? Or they all One fell off the like, edge of the earth. Heaven, I can be like. <laughs> so, yes, I actually, if I would have, uh, I would have taught the lesson almost, it was funny, a couple of times I wrote things in that I would say when I got up here, and then he'd, he'd say it, he said it the very next moment, you know what I mean, so he did a great job, I didn't give him notes, now he taught how he wanted to teach it, but in my notes, I, I rely on the story of the virgins, the ten virgins, when I would teach on this, I rely on that story a lot, so, uh, but, so, it is important uh, that we uh, that we're not that we understand we could be wrong and just be ready. The Bible says to occupy till he comes. It doesn't matter when it is. I want you to you understand the clear things that are important for us to get out of teaching about the rapture. Okay. And uh, the last couple of things are uh, that we also um, that we know that it's the dead in Christ will rise, and then those who remain. Be caught up. It is not the judgment seat. It is not that moment. Okay. It is. It is the dead in Christ shall rise. Those who are Christians rise, not the non-believer. People think non-believer. No non-believer. That's not yet. It happens later. Okay. Clarity. I want you to understand the difference. Okay. Uh, and then also, um, you know, I also believe that we don't want to get stuck on. Uh, on this issue and not be argumentative about it. It really doesn't matter. We should never be separate. There are lots of there are lots of things in the Bible like that. That but 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 end time prophecy is the worst one to get yourself pigeonholed into believing something and to the point that you are argumentative or you think down about other people or or whatever. It's not worth it. We got the Bible makes it clear what our goal should be. And I'm a broken record. What are we supposed to be doing right now? Reaching lost. Reaching lost. Occupying till he comes is what the scripture says. Reaching the lost. Doing our job. Getting as many people saved as we can. Keep our kids out of hell. Keep our kids. Keep our children. Go the right direction. Keep people around us, our family, and our friends. Occupy. Be a Christian. Do the things you're supposed to do. Amen? Amen. All right.